All right, welcome back. Robert Breaker here, and today we're going to start Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. We finished up with 17 last time, and it took us two videos to get through that. But there was a lot of good information in Acts chapter 17. Now we're going to start today in Acts chapter 18. And we need to remind ourselves what we're looking at here. We're still looking at the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. So this is Paul's second missionary journey, and I went ahead and left the map up here of what we've seen so far, of where he left from Antioch. He went to Derby and Lystra. From there he went to another Antioch. Remember, there's two Antiochs. There's Antioch of Syria, and then Antioch up here of, I believe it's of Phrygia. And uh, then he goes over here, passes through there, but he's really going to Derby and Lystra first, then to Troas. Then he ends up in Philippi, and somehow went through Neapolis. It appears. He ended up in Neapolis, then Philippi, excuse me. Then from there he goes to Amphipolis, and then to Apollonia. Then he goes down here to Thessalonica, and of course we have in our Bible, First and Second Thessalonians. Then he comes down here to Berea, and then he goes down to Athens. And we're going to see today him going to Corinth, and we have in our Bible, First and Second Corinthians. So it's really amazing as we're reading through the Bible about Paul, our apostle, by the way. We are under the ministry of Paul today. <laughs> I still don't understand why people can't see that. If you read the book of Acts, you can't miss that we are under the ministry of Paul. He is called the apostle to the Gentiles, and he is our apostle today. Someone told me you can still go to YouTube and see videos against Robert Breaker where people say, Robert Breaker, you're a liar, you're a heretic, you don't know what you're talking about. We're not under Paul's ministry, we're under Jesus' ministry. <laughs> and you just want to laugh. Uh, one of them is some computer voice lady. I won't even show the person's face, but it's a computer voice where it says, Robert Breaker is a liar. We are not under Paul's ministry today. We are under the ministry of Jesus. I mean, it's just... It's ridiculous the links that people go to to try to prove their false doctrine. When if we simply read the Bible, what we find is the early book of Acts was more for Jews. Really only preaching to Jews. As the book of Acts continues, we find out, oh, God finally gets some Gentiles saved and lets the Gentiles get saved. And Peter was used more for Jews while Paul was used more for Gentiles. But you cannot say, as some hyper-dispensationalists do, that Peter only went to Jews and Paul only went to Gentiles. Because Peter was the first one to see Gentiles saved in Acts chapter 10 and 11. And Paul, everywhere he went, and we're going to see this again today, Paul always went to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. So it is, it is erroneous to say, as some people do, that Peter only preached the gospel to Jews and Paul only preached the gospel to Gentiles. That is not correct. They preached to both. But Peter was more in the rest of his life only focusing in on Jews. And Paul, as we read the book of Acts, he was going to Jews all the time, but then there finally became a time when he said, okay, I'm only going to go to the to the Gentiles and not Jews anymore. But as we'll find today, even after he says that, he still ends up going to the Jew. <laughs> Peter always loved his own people, the Jews. He says, if it were possible, he would have gone to hell for them, if that meant they could have got saved. He says that in the book of Romans. So Paul has a soft spot in his heart for the Jewish people, because they're his people. So we're looking at this, and we're reading this, and we're seeing the preaching of Paul. And remember, I have shown you this before, but I feel like I have to say it again, that in the early book of Acts, you know, the ministry was the who gospel. Preaching who Jesus is. And that who preaching is actually starts back here with John. John was baptizing to show people who Jesus was. Jesus shows up and says, Who do the men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So, and Peter and the early apostles are all trying to convince the Jews that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. And so the book of Acts, that's the message in the early book of Acts. Jesus is the Messiah, He is the King, He is the Lord, He is the Christ. You do not preach that message today for salvation. Yes, we need to tell people who Jesus is, but that doesn't save us. Paul focuses in on the message of what Jesus did. And so a lot of Paul's ministry is telling people what Jesus did, 
And what did Jesus do? He shed his blood for our sins and that our salvation is whether or not we trust in the blood atonement of Christ. For the forgiveness of sins comes based not upon what we do, but what Jesus Christ did for us. So, as we go through this chapter of chapter 17, we're going to see Paul going to the Jews first, giving them the who message, and then giving them the message of what Jesus did for them. Because what saves us today is the message of what Jesus did. And what is that main message of Paul? Well, Paul was preaching what he preached in Acts 13, 38, and 39. And that, to me, corresponds completely with 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Paul's main message is that we're justified by faith. And what are we justified by faith in? Justified by faith in the blood. It's all about the blood atonement of Christ, the sacrificial blood atonement of Jesus Christ. So with all this in mind, let's continue here as we're studying the second missionary journey of Paul. And in verse 18, it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. So we see Paul leaving Athens, and he goes to Corinth. So I have already drew up here a little... Already a red marker's going out, isn't that something? We drew up here our line where he goes from Athens up here to Corinth. Okay, so what does he do there? Now, in Corinth, Paul starts a church. He gets people saved, and that's where we get the books of First and Second Corinthians. I might have already said that, but sometimes I repeat myself. I can't help. But it says, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Now, verse 2. And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. Alright, so the Jews, for some reason, were told, we don't like you anymore. We don't want you to be here. We want you gone. So the Jews were kicked out of Rome. Rome has never liked Jews. As time goes on in the history, the Roman Catholic Church was formed in Rome. And if you study history, the Roman Catholic Church never liked the Jews. Roman Catholics were very much against Jews and persecuted them in the Spanish Inquisition. So for some reason, Rome is very anti-Jewish. Now, they came from Rome to Corinth. So we see two players, if you will, coming from here to here, and they meet up with Paul. And these two people that come and meet Paul are Aquila and Priscilla. Now you might remember them. Because as we've studied our verse-by-verse -verse Bible study through Romans, through 1 Corinthians, and through 2 Timothy, these two have been mentioned. So they are two people that help Paul a lot. Let's go ahead and look at that. Before we do, though, I don't know what Aquila means. I think it means eagle, because um, it sounds like eagle. Aguila in Spanish is eagle, so Aquila could mean eagle. But the word Priscilla means helper, and I find that very interesting. So here's a husband and a wife, and they're traveling together. Now go to Romans chapter 16 and verse 3. And when Paul is writing to the Romans, he says in Romans 16:3, Greet Priscilla and Aquila my helpers in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, they're helpers. They help me in preaching the gospel. And we're going to see here in chapter 19, or maybe it's the end of this chapter, if I remember correctly, how they helped Paul by finding somebody that all he knew was this message, and they brought him to the true message of Paul. So they were helpers of Christ. Matter of fact, continue there, reading verse 4. Romans 16, 3 says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ. Verse 4 says, Who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. So these people were willing to give their life for the cause of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, they're mentioned again. So this husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla, served the Lord and were willing to die for him if need be. They risked their hazard their lives and risked their lives for the cause of Christ. 1 Corinthians 16, 19 Paul says, The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Well, here's Asia over here. So Aquila and Priscilla eventually came over this way. And they came to Asia and they, and they had a house. They must have bought a house or built a house or something. So it's interesting that we see Aquila and Priscilla coming to Paul. And Paul was a missionary. And what is he doing? He's finding other people and making them missionaries too. They move from their home in Rome, come to Corinth, and then end up over in Asia, have a church in their house. And they are people that Paul says are helping him and hazarding their 
lives for the cause of Christ. 2 Timothy 4. They are mentioned again. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 19. So, salute Aquila and Priscilla and the household of Onesiphorus. So remember Aquila and Priscilla, Timothy. Now who's Timothy? Well, he was following Paul. Remember last time we looked at how he was circumcised in order to be able to reach the Jews to say, I'm one of you, I'm a circumcised Jew. Even though that doesn't save us, being circumcised, he, like Paul, became all things for all men that he might win some. So there's a lot of people that Paul is teaching, and they're becoming missionaries and preachers and teachers. Matter of fact, Timothy becomes a pastor later on. So back to Acts chapter 18. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. Verse 2, And found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. And he came to them. So he comes across here. And then in verse 3, And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. Wrought means work. He worked with them. Now they're not working for their salvation. They're working to make money to continue traveling and preaching. But it says, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. The Apostle Paul was a tent maker. I find that so interesting. He's out there making tents. A tent maker is someone who builds tents. Now, it's not little thin sheeted tents like you get at Walmart nowadays. They, they were probably very thick canvas. And uh, people would take these tents and oftentimes as they traveled, they set up a tent in the middle of the night, in the middle of the wilderness to spend the night. And so this was something that a lot of people needed. They needed tents as they traveled on horses or on camels or things like that. So it sounds like they had a pretty good business. They made enough money to be able to travel a lot. And people say, well, who needs money in the Roman Empire because the roads were so good, you just walk. Okay, But they're making money here by working. So Paul worked as a missionary. And he worked and did his job while he traveled and preached the gospel. Now verse 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. So what did he do? Well, look at verse 4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. I think I forgot to read verse 4. So verse 4, after Paul comes to Corinth, the first thing he does is look for the synagogue. He always goes to the Jew first then to the Gentile or the Greek. So here he goes to the Jews in Corinth and reasons with them. And what's the message that he's trying to portray to them? Who Jesus is. Before he can get to this message, trust the blood of Christ, he has to show them who Christ is. So the Jews' eyes will be open and they'll realize, you know what? Jesus was the Messiah. And we as a nation, we rejected our Messiah. Now we need to be saved. Now, look what happened. Verse 6, And when they opposed themselves, who is this? The Jews. When they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto him, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. Now some people will say, and this right here is where Paul only preaches to Gentiles and never to another Jew. This is the dividing line in the book of Acts, according to them, in which Paul only goes to Gentiles. Well, there's a problem with that. I mean, that sounds good, but are you reading the Bible? <laughs> Look at chapter 18 and verse 19. Acts 18, 19. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Okay, so he's still going to Jews. Look at verse 26. 18, 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. <laughs> Look at verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews in that publicly showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So Paul, I think, just speaks in anger here in verse 6. And he says, I'm only going to the Gentiles from now on, but he just spoke in anger. He really later thought about it and said, no, the Jews still need to be saved. So everywhere he went, he still went to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Many people that I've met that claim to be uh, hyper-dispensationalists, they ask, well, are you an Acts 10 believer? Are you an Acts 18 believer? Are you an Acts 20 whatever believer? And I've never feel, fully understood what they're even talking about. But they tried to rightly divide the book of Acts, and, and they try to make such a dividing line that they say, so this is it. When Paul says, I'm going to the Gentiles from now on, why, from there on, he's only going to Gentiles. And that's not going to work, because you read the rest of the book of Acts, he's still going to Jews. Still trying to get Jews safe. So, you can't get too overly 
um, rambunctious, I guess is the word, uh, when it comes to dividing the book of Acts. You've got to kind of look at it and say, okay, yeah, Paul said that, but I think he said it in anger. He was angry with the Jews for blaspheming Jesus Christ, and he said that to them, but he still continues, as we continue reading the book, that he still continued going to Jews first. Now, we see him going and doing this. Everything that he did, he did to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Go back to Acts 17. Acts 17, 1. When he had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, then he came to Thessalonica, where it was a synagogue of the Jews. Verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Look at verse 10 goes to another place. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Look at verse 17. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. Where is he now? He's in Athens. So everywhere that Paul goes, he goes to the Jew first. I've met some people that uh, claim to be Bible believers. They, they like to call themselves Bereans. And they say, Paul only preached to Gentiles, not to Jews. What are you dealing with? Well, the person might be saved, but the person is listening to what someone else told them. They're not reading the Bible for themselves. You cannot make such an open-ended, silly statement like that if you simply read the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, Paul is going always to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. And we're going to continue reading this, and I'm going to continue pointing this out as we continue all the way to the end of the book. We've got ten chapters left to go. How Paul always cared about his own people, the Jews. Now, there might have been a time toward the very end of the book when he says, now I'm only going to Gentiles. Let me show you that. But from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 28, Paul still hasn't given up on the Jews. Look at uh, Acts chapter 28. Chapter 28, if Paul says... Verse 27, For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their ears, and hear with, uh, see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. What he's doing, he's he's taking, I want to say it's Matthew 13, 15, let me make sure. He's actually quoting Jesus Christ here in Matthew 13, 15, and he's saying this is what the Jews are. 13, 15, is it? Yes, Matthew 13, 15, okay, good, I remember it correctly. So he's quoting Jesus Christ. And he says here, talking about the Jews, in the very end of the book of Acts, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they will hear it. So Paul is preaching to the Gentiles. But he never gave up on the Jews, and in the very end of the book, Romans chapter, uh, um, Acts chapter 28, <laughs> he's still trying to convince the Jews. So Paul never gave up on the Jews. He did realize that as a nation they rejected their Messiah, but he also understood that as an individual, a Jew can be saved today. And Paul understood that, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. God's not saving the nation of Israel now, but an individual Jew can be saved. But the nation will be saved during the tribulation. So you've got to get a hold of that difference between the nation and the individual. God's in the business of saving individuals now. Now we go back to Acts chapter 18. So in Acts chapter 18, verse 5, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. He's hammering over and over that the Jews need to see who Jesus was. Before he could get to this message of trust the blood, he had to show whose blood it was. And he's trying to show them that Jesus is the Messiah, and they blasphemed. They probably said something stupid like, Jesus was nothing but a bastard. You say, oh, how could you say that? Well, you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Pharisees said that about Jesus. They said, you're a bastard child. Your mother, Mary, got pregnant out of wedlock. No, no, it was a miracle of God. God put in her the seed, uh, the, the, the holy thing it's called. I don't even know. If, yeah, it's the seed of the woman, so the seed. And uh, God allowed Joseph to marry her, and he, he is born the Son of God. Jesus Christ is God the Son. Okay? And what a horrible thing to say Jesus Christ is a bastard child. But yet, we are told that's what the Pharisees said, and they blasphemed. So it's probably the same thing here. Probably the Jews say, said, Paul, you're just such a 
stinking liar. You're trying to make some bastard child into God. And make it, we, we, we reject that. And the Bible says they blasphemed. And so now we see Paul speaking in haste. He shook his raiment and said to them. So he probably took off his, his clothes and just kind of shook them and said, You guys, you're going to hell. You don't even know it. You need to get saved. Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm clean because I told you the truth. From now on, I'm only going to go tell the Gentiles. And a lot of people say, and then, from then on, Paul only preached to Gentiles. But that's not true, because as we continue in the chapter, and as we continue on all the way to the end of the book, he's still going to Jews first. So I think Paul said this in haste a little bit. Now, verse 7, And he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. I think that's so interesting because he's in Corinth, okay? And he finds a guy and gets a guy saved named Justice. And that guy opens up his house and says, come on in and live with me. Stay here as long as you want. Remember, there was a woman named Lydia that did that and allowed him to stay in her house for as long as he wanted. Remember, there was another man named Jason that said, hey, come live in my house. These were people that Paul led to the Lord. So Paul probably led this guy, Justice, to the Lord. And Justice says, you come live with me. And it says his house was joined hard to the synagogue, okay? His house was here, the synagogue was here. Joined hard together sounds like they were, they shared the same wall. So, literally, Paul was right next door to the synagogue. Where the Jews, some got saved and came out, and the others said, we hate you, and they blasphemed Jesus. And he's living right next door to these people that blasphemed. So he's living right next door to people that hated him. But they didn't do what others did in chapter 17. Other Jews were so angry, they, they went and they got the, the, the mob to come in and try to get him and beat him and put him in jail and, and uh, you know, whip him and, and things like that. They kind of let bygones be bygones and they just kind of blasphemed and said, oh, we don't believe in your Jesus or whatever. So he's sitting there next to the synagogue and he's still trying to get the Jews saved. Now, verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now, did you get that? This is incredible. The chief ruler of the synagogue. So the man in charge of the synagogue. Now, in a church, when a man's the, the, the guy in charge, we call him a pastor or an elder or a bishop. I don't know what you call the guy who's the guy that moderate. I guess the moderator would be what they call in Jewish synagogue. Uh, the rabbi, I guess rabbi means teacher. So he would be a, the rabbi. He would have been the chief rabbi of the synagogue, this guy named Crispus. And he believed. So he read the scriptures like those in Berea, and he said, it's true. Jesus was our Christ. Why would he believe that? Because the book of Daniel, there was a prophecy about it, and he understood. And then he believed he did die for our sins, and I accept that by faith. So Paul gets the chief ruler of the synagogue saved. Too bad he couldn't get the rest of the people saved, because the rest of the people rejected it. So Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So Christmas gets saved. Now, it doesn't say it here, but it sounds like he had to leave the synagogue because the others wouldn't accept it. So he literally became a convert and got out of the Jewish synagogue. And that's where the church in Corinthians started. Now when you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, we find Crispus is mentioned again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So Crispus was an interesting fella. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And that's what's so neat about reading the book of Acts. In Paul's epistles, he writes about things that took place in the book of Acts. We just read that Crispus got saved and people in his house, and they got baptized. All right, so Crispus is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse uh, 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Now, who was Gaius? Well, he was someone else in Corinth. And he says, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of hold of Stephanus, besides I know not whether I baptized any other. So here Paul is, is talking about, remember back there when I went to Corinth and I was preaching and I was getting people saved? Well, I got the guy named Crispus saved. And I remember I baptized him, but I don't remember baptizing anybody else in this community. 
except this fellow over here, Stephanus. Now watch what he says next, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Now remember Peter's preaching. Peter preaches, Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized in water, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. To this very day, people say, and you still have to be baptized in water to be saved. No, the book of Acts is a transitional book. The Jews were baptized in water. And the Jews had to have that water baptism. But as the book of Acts continues, we see a change from water baptism to you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost baptism. And we see when a person does be baptized in the water, they are baptized when they get saved. So they get the Holy Spirit by faith, not by water baptism. So you've got to get a hold of that. Now do you remember the very first chapter of the book of Acts? We started the book of Acts and I pointed out to you Acts 1.5. Now I'm talking about this right now because there are denominations out there that tell you you have to be baptized in water to be saved and when you're baptized in water that's when you get salvation. That is a lie. As we're reading the book of Acts we're seeing that when they do baptize people in water it's after they've believed and after they receive the Holy Spirit. See the book of Acts is a transitional book. There's things changing from Jews to Gentiles, from Peter to Paul, from uh, the synagogues to the church. From Israel to the body of Christ. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 5, this is what Jesus says. And I have to harp on this because there are many people out there that are lost. And they belong to what they call the Church of Christ. And the Church of Christ preaches a message in which they take the entire book of Acts and they just put it all together. And they say, yeah, believe Paul's message, but if you don't get baptized in water, you'll go to hell. So they try to force all of it together. They don't see the right dividing. They don't see the transition. Water baptism does not save us today. Jesus even said in Acts 1.5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And we start out seeing water baptism. But Jesus said in the very beginning of the book, but there's going to be another baptism. And this is the one that's the most important. It's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Paul, or excuse me, I was, they both start with peace, so sometimes it's so easy to get confused. But Peter sees some Gentiles get saved in chapter 10. And in chapter 11, he talks. And look what he says in Acts chapter 11. All right, I hate to go back on something we've already seen, but it's important to see this. Um, Acts chapter 10, he leads Cornelius and his band to the Lord. And it says in verse 44, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So they got the Holy Spirit by faith when they believed. Back here in Acts 2.38, somebody got the Holy Spirit by water baptism. Here somebody got the water baptism by believing. Believing. Alright? And what did they get? They got the Holy Ghost. So they got baptized in water after, but it was after they already got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. So as you're reading the book of Acts, you clearly see that it starts out with water baptism. And people get the Holy Spirit through water baptism in Acts chapter 2. But that is not the plan of salvation or the gospel for today. And so Peter is retelling about these Gentiles getting saved in Acts chapter 10. And look what he says in Acts chapter 11 when he retells the story in verse uh, 16. Acts 11.16, Peter says, Then remember I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave to them the like gift, as he did gave unto the like, uh, like gift, as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? God is saving Gentiles. Verse 18, it says, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance. So as we're going through the book of Acts, we're clearly seeing a change. In the ministry of Paul, nobody gets saved by being baptized in water. You say, but what about chapter 19? I can't wait to get to Acts chapter 19 because I told you from the very beginning that the book of Acts is a hard book to understand. It's a, uh, how do you explain it? It's a transitional book. There's a lot of changes going on. And the doctrine of the church is not fully set in stone till the, toward the end of the book. 
So there's some things going on in the book of Acts, and there's some changes taking place. Peter is telling the Jews in the early book of Acts, you have to be baptized in water to get the Holy Spirit. Paul is over here, and he goes to Corinth. He gets somebody saved, and then he gets them baptized in water after they're saved. And then he turns around, he writes a book back to them, 1 Corinthians, he says, I wasn't sent to baptize, I was sent to preach the gospel. So Paul is saying, look, the emphasis of salvation is the gospel, whether or not you believe. If you believe, that's when you're saved. And when you believe, that's when you get the Holy Spirit. It's not the water that saves you. So we clearly see a difference. We clearly see a saint. Now I just throw that out there for you people who think that you're saved by water baptism. You're not. That is not what the Apostle Paul preaches. Paul says in Ephesians, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All right, what's the one baptism? It must be the Holy Spirit baptism. He says in 1 Corinthians 12, we are all baptized into one spirit. When do we get baptized in the Holy Spirit? When we believe. Ephesians 1.13. Please read Ephesians 1.13. I'll go ahead and read it for you. And Paul goes to Ephesians shortly after this. As a matter of fact, I believe, if I remember correct, he goes from here to Ephesus. And so let's uh, read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Paul's teaching of being saved and receiving the Holy Spirit is not the early message of Peter that you get the Holy Spirit by water baptism. Paul's message of receiving the Holy Spirit baptism is when you believe. Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. 1 Corinthians 15.1-4, The blood atonement of Christ, salvation by faith, justified by faith. In whom after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So when a person gets saved today, they get the Holy Spirit the moment they believe. Now there's a huge denomination in the world today that call themselves the Charismatics or the Pentecostals. They do not, let me repeat myself, they do not rightly divide the word of truth. The Pentecostals teach, and I can say what they teach because I was deceived and I was in that false denomination for four years before I got saved. They teach, oh, well, you come over here and you hear Paul and you, and you accept Paul's gospel, but yeah, yeah, you can, you can become a child of God or whatever by believing that, but you don't get the Holy Spirit. They go all the way back to Acts chapter 2 and they say, the only way for you to get the Holy Spirit is by speaking in tongues. <laughs> and you say, uh, no. No, what you're doing is you're taking the book of Acts like a buffet table and you're taking what you want and trying to force it into your doctrine. You can't do that. You have to realize there's a change. Tongues are for a sign, not for us, the Greeks, but for the Jews. Tongues are always a written, spoken language. In fact, in chapter 2, it tells us what the languages were. And what the Charismatics say is, well, you can get saved, but you don't have the Holy Spirit until you speak in tongues. But then you can lose it and get it back and 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 lose it and get it back. What are they doing? They're coming over here to the Jewish part of Acts that was only to Jews, and they're trying to force it over here. You can't. We have to understand all that back there was for Jews. Then there's a transition. There's a change. And today, the way it's set up is, when you believe you receive the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13. And you cannot lose the Holy Spirit because it's sealed inside of you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit when you believe the Gospel. So I am not a Pentecostal. I'm not a, uh, what do you call it, a charismatic. I do not believe their false doctrine of saying that a person can lose their salvation. If you can lose it, then the Holy Spirit is a liar. And God's a liar because you weren't sealed in the first place. Salvation is eternal life. You say, you mean you believe in once saved, always saved, Robert Breaker? Yes. And I believe it because Paul taught it. And I believe it because I can rightly divide the word of truth. I look at the book of Acts and I make the divisions that God says to rightly divide. Oh, this was only for the Jews. This is how God was dealing with them because this, the kingdom still could have come if the nation had accepted. But the nation rejected. So God said, Paul, from now on, preach this message and tell people about what I did, and they can be saved by trusting in my blood. And when they're saved, they're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And that is the baptism that Jesus says is the one that's the most important, and the one that is to come. So the one about back here isn't that important. Now people say, well then you're a hyper-dispensationalist, Robert Breaker, because you don't believe water baptism is for this age. I didn't say that. One of the things that hyper-dispensationalists say is, we don't have to be baptized in water today, and it's not for this age. And I say, okay, I can totally see that. But I don't say that. 
uh, I, as we continue reading the book of Acts here, we're going to find that when a guy gets saved, he gets baptized in water after as a testimony. So does that eventually peter out, the water baptism thing? It looks like it could. But here's the thing. Water baptism is not necessary for salvation. So I will agree with a hyperdispensationalist that water baptism is not necessary for salvation. Now, will I go as far as them and say, now you don't ever need to be baptized? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, after I got saved, I got baptized. I don't to this day say, and now I'm saved because I'm baptized. No. I looked at that as, that's just to show others that I am saved. It's a testimony of my salvation. It's me saying, look, I just want you all to know that I'm saved, and I'm willing to do this to prove to you that I'm a Christian. And some people say, well, you can't be a member of a church unless you've been baptized in water. So a lot of people, the only reason they get baptized is so they can join a church. But baptism in water has nothing to do with your salvation. And as we're reading the book of Acts, we clearly see that it's not water baptism that gives us the Holy Spirit today. It might have back then when it was still dealing with Jews, but not today. Now you say, yeah, but Acts 19. I can't wait to get to Acts 19. I'm going to show you some things. But we're still in Acts 18 here, okay? So Acts 18, verse 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So they were baptized in water after they believed. It wasn't the water baptism that saved them or gave them the Holy Spirit. They believed and got the Holy Spirit the moment they believed, and they were baptized in water afterward at a testimony, as a testimony of, hey, we, we identify as, as Christians. Now verse 9, they spake, Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. What a wonderful thing for the Lord to tell him. Paul, don't be afraid to preach what you're preaching. God says, don't hold your peace. Don't be scared to speak up, and don't stay quiet. Keep preaching. Keep preaching what you're supposed to preach. I tell that to people today. People ask me, Brother Breaker, I'm saved now, and I don't know what to do with my life. Okay? Here's what you need to do with your life. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not your peace. Go everywhere you go and tell everyone you know the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, faith in the blood atonement justified by faith. Because that is the very reason that you are here, to get other people saved. Uh, sometimes people ask me, Brother Breaker, I'm just, my life is just so awful, I'm saved and I know it. What about suicide, Brother Breaker? Should I... Is it okay for me to commit suicide? If a Christian commits suicide, I mean, is that okay? And I always tell them the exact same thing. I say, look, you are here to get people saved and take somebody with you to heaven. Why would you just say, I can't do it, and kill yourself and go to heaven? That is very selfish to just want to go there by yourself. If you're going to live in this world and you're saved then don't be selfish. It's not all about you. It's about somebody else getting saved. Do your best to not be afraid and to speak to others and win somebody else to Jesus so that when they die, they'll go to heaven too. And take somebody with you to heaven. I'm not saying go kill somebody and take them with you, <laughs> double suicide them. I'm saying we're all going to die someday or we're all going at the rapture if we don't die. And so what we need to do is be active in evangelizing the world, preaching the gospel to lost people so that when we go at the rapture or when we die, there'll be somebody else that goes to heaven because we preach to them the gospel. And that's what we're supposed to do. So, continue here, verse 10. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. So God speaks to Paul and says this to him. Now, verse 11, and he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul was there for a year and a half. That's a long time. This is the first time here we're told how long he stayed somewhere. Uh, so before, it seems like he goes, stays a little while, and then goes. But he's staying here for a year and a half. And he's teaching the Word of God to them. And this is interesting because First and Second Corinthians, he's writing to probably the most sinful church of all the churches that Paul planted and started. There's a lot of fornication. There's a lot of... Uh, arguing and fighting and backbiting in the church of Corinth. The people got saved, they got the Holy Spirit, but they walked in the flesh instead of the Spirit. And so probably one of the worst churches, besides Laodicea, which we know is a really bad church, was the Corinth, where there was a lot of wickedness going on. And Paul is writing to them and saying, do this, do that, do that, the other thing. But he stayed there longer, it seems like. So why would that be the worst church? Because it's right here so close to Athens. Athens is the center of Greek culture. 
and the Greeks were Gentiles. Oftentimes, how many times in the Bible have we read where Paul says to the Jew first, then to the Greek? What is the Greek? The Greek is the Gentile. And so the Greeks were the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were sinners exceedingly before the Lord. The Gentiles were fornicators and adulterers and idol worshippers and blood drinkers and into bestiality and other evil sinful things, worshipping fallen angels and things like that. So Paul got them saved. And these people are getting saved in the, in the worst city in the world, probably the most sinful city in the world, Athens. And Corinth is right next door. It'd be like the equivalent of somebody getting saved in New York City. <laughs> New York City is sinful. It's wicked. There's so much evil and wickedness. I've been there about six times to New York City. And uh, there are very few good Bible-believing churches in New York City. There, there's a need for one there. And getting saved in a city that's so wicked, it's hard as a Christian to live for the Lord. So don't look at it as, oh, I'm in a place full of people that are evil. Look at it as, what an opportunity. There's more lost people here than anywhere else. Now I can go tell them how to get saved. And that's what we're supposed to do is continue preaching and teaching. Now, verse 12. And when Galileo was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Now, we've seen this already in Acts 17. Paul preaches to the Jews. They get upset. Then they go to the secular government and say, hey, get rid of this guy. So they're going to do it here again. And they're going to try to get Paul whipped and beat and put in jail like they did before. And so that's that's what they're doing here. They're trying again to do the same thing that, that has happened to him in other cities. And when he and have I explained this well enough? Put yourselves in the shoes of Paul today. The equivalent of what Paul is doing in his day would be if you were to go to a city and find a false religious church, let's say it's a Seventh day Adventist church. And you walk in that church, and you say, I've got something to say. I know you guys believe this, that, and the other thing, but the Bible says this, this, and this. What would the church say? Get out of here! Who the heck are you to come into our religious denominational headquarters system and tell us that we're wrong and that you're right? Who do you think you are? <laughs> they would probably kick you right out. They'd probably call the cops, and they'd have you dragged out of their, their building. So that's the equivalent of what Paul's doing in his day. He's going to the religious people in every city, and he's saying, look, y'all are wrong. Y'all need to come to the Bible. Let me show you what the Bible says, because y'all are wrong. <laughs> and some accept, and others don't. But those that don't, they're upset. They're like, who is this guy to tell us we're wrong? We've been worshiping this way for thousands of years. Who are and no wonder they're upset. He's trying to buck their tradition. So they go to the secular government, and they try to get judgment against Paul. It's like they're calling the police, if you will, saying, Hey, this guy's coming in and disrupting our service. We're supposed to have the freedom of religion. And this guy's coming in and telling us we're all wrong. What a, what a troublemaker. Would you get rid of this guy? <laughs> so in verse 13, it says, Saying this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. So he's in the Jewish synagogue. And they're saying, he's coming in here telling us that our law is wrong. He's trying to tell us that we're all worshiping the wrong way and that we're wrong. So please, Mr. Ruler, Galilo, verse 12, Mr. Deputy, the deputy, well, what's that? A deputy would be a, a sheriff. Hey, Mr. Policeman, this guy, why he's coming in and trying to disrupt our services and tell us we're not worshiping right. Get rid of this guy. Now look at verse 14. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Galileo said unto the Jews, <laughs> So Paul is there. Here's the, here's the picture. They probably lays hand on Paul, took him up to the main sheriff guy in charge. And they're, they're like, this guy, he just came into our place unannounced, and he's trying to tell everybody that you know his religion's right and ours is wrong, this troublemaker, do something with him. And Paul goes, well, and about that time, Paul's about to speak, and the guy goes, no, 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 shush, shush, shush. Don't even let Paul defend himself. And when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo Gal Gal said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wickedness or lewdness, right? If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. So if this guy was evil and wicked and lewd, if he was just there to be a troublemaker, then, then I, would, I would listen. But he says, it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like what you have here is a doctrinal issue. 
and, and I'm a secular governor, if you will, and I'm not going to get involved in your religious quarrels. That's what this man is saying. Verse 15, But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. I'm not going to become religious like you in order to give you a religious um, uh, uh, sentence on what I think is right and wrong. Basically, this is how he weasels out of it. No, I am not a religious person. I don't want anything to do with your religion. You guys go take care of it. Leave me alone. The guy's not a murderer. He's not a criminal. He's not killing people. <laughs> Leave him alone. He's not a robber. So he said, I'm not going to be a judge of such matters. But it, it is interesting in verse 15, but it'd be a question of words and names. It's a question of a name. There's a name that the Jews hated. What was that name? The name is Jesus. And I've told you before, the word Jesus is a compound word. It's J is short for Jehovah. And Seuss is saves. So what is Paul preaching? He's telling the Jews, Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, came down to die for you, and he'll save you if you'll trust his blood. I mean, it's right there in the name of Jesus, Jehovah saves. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, if you'll trust him. So verse 16, and he drave them from the judgment seat. He drave them. What does that mean? He 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 got his guys to just start. Either they were hitting them or whipping them or what. But they were they were just get out of here, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. So it, it backfired. These Jews are trying to make Paul to be the bad guy, and the secular government goes. As far as I'm concerned, you're all idiots. You're all the bad guys. I don't. You're a silly religion. Just get these guys out. So all the big old uh, you know policemen are coming out, just shoving them and shoving them and shoving them out. So the Jews didn't get what they wanted that time. It didn't work like it worked before where Paul was put in jail. Verse 17, Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Galilo cared for none of those things. Even more, the chief ruler of the synagogue, all right, the synagogue, those that got saved got out of the synagogue and followed Paul. Those who are in the synagogue are still there, and they're saying, this guy Paul is trying to destroy our religion and, and overthrow our law. And instead of this guy, Galilo, putting Paul in jail, he said, where's that chief ruler of the synagogue again? Sosthenes, get over here. Beat the garbage out of this guy. Beat the ever-loving you-know-what out of him for even bringing this to me because I'm so sick of dealing with these Jews. <laughs> So again, it gives you the mindset of the Gentiles. Gentiles didn't very really like Jews much. And Jews didn't like Gentiles, except for the fact when the Gentiles were in charge, while well, they were happy to go and say, Hey, Mr. Gentile, would you judge us according to your law? And the Gentiles were like, Yeah, but you got your own law. You're supposed to judge according to that. Leave me alone. So they beat Sosthenes, who then became the chief ruler of the synagogue. Okay, Before, Crispus was the chief ruler of the synagogue. Now we see a new ruler of the synagogue, and his name is Sosthenes. And he's the guy in charge. Now this is what's very, very, very interesting. Because this is not the only time that the Bible mentions Sosthenes. Sosthenes is mentioned again in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And when he's mentioned by Paul again, he's mentioned as a saved man. Whoo, I'm getting goosebumps. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1, look at this. Something happens here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ to the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. So Sosthenes, now I'm, I understand I'm kind of reading between the lines a little bit, but I kind of have to because I'm trying to get this all together. When Paul goes to Corinth, he goes to the synagogue and begins to preach, and the guy in charge was named Crispus, and he gets saved. And I guess he leaves the synagogue, and there's other people that get saved that leave the synagogue. And then this other guy must have taken over named Sosthenes. And there's people in the synagogue, verse 6, blaspheming God. And telling Paul, you're wrong, you're not right. So there was a split in the synagogue, and some believed and some didn't. And the chief ruler, the chief rabbi, believed and left with Paul, Crispus. Sosthenes then takes over. And Sosthenes and these other guys, they try to go to the law against Paul and say, Paul's a liar. And then the chief ruler says, I'm going to beat you, Sosthenes, for even coming to me with this stinking garbage. I don't want to listen to you guys. And yet later, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse, Paul says, and our brother Sosthenes. So somewhere in there, 
after Sosthenes got the ever-loving you-know-what beat out of him, he started to think, something to this Paul guy. He's going around telling everybody all this. I just got beat for this. I'm going to start reading my scripture. And Sosthenes got saved. Then he left the synagogue and came with Paul. What an amazing story. You didn't know that was in the Bible, did you? Oh, that's why it's so important to read the Bible. Okay, so continuing here, verse 18. And Paul, after he tarried there yet a good while. All right, we already saw that he's there for a year and a half, a year and six months. So he tarried even longer, a good while. What, another year? Another two years? I don't know. And then took his leave of the brother and sailed thence unto Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Chinchuria, for he had a vow. Okay, so he eventually, after however many years he lived there, he left and he came over here to, where did he go again? He uh, sailed thence to, unto Syria. Okay, this is Syria up here. So he came over to Syria, and and he came to Ephesus. Well, Ephesus is here. Syria is over here. So he must have come over here somewhere. And then he turned around and come right back over here to Ephesus. So I covered up the word Ephesus, but hopefully you can read it. So he goes to Ephesus. And with him come who? With him come um, Aquila and Priscilla. Now, he shaves his head and makes a vow. Now, there's some vows in the Old Testament that you can do. So what he's doing, he's a lot of people say, well, what we're going to read here is Paul is still under the law. I don't believe that. Remember, we've read where Paul says, I become all things for all men that I might win some. And we're about to see Paul wanting to go back to Israel. And so he shaves his head because he's going to pretend to be a Jew in order to get right into the middle of the synagogue so he can preach to the Jews again. That's what he did. You see, they came and snuck into the church, many of these Jews, and tried to get people back to the law. So Paul says, well, I'll just do what they're doing. I'll go into their church and try to get people out of there and get them to the church, get them to the truth. I'll go into their synagogue and get them saved. It's kind of funny when you think about it. So verse 19, he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So again, he goes to the Jews. After saying, in verse 6, from henceforth I will only go to the Gentiles. <laughs> I will go to the Gentiles. So yet he goes back to the Jews again. Verse 20, when they desired him to tarry a longer time with him, he consented not. Why? Verse 21, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. Why would he want to keep a feast in Jerusalem? People say because he's still under the law and we're still under the law today. No, we've seen that Paul preaches we're not under the law. So I don't think Paul is trying to follow the law and be at a feast. I think in his mind, Paul is thinking, there's this feast, and I know it's going to happen on this day, and I want the Jews to get saved, so you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to when the most Jews are there, so I can reach even more Jews with the gospel. And that's what he did. And so it says, and when he landed at Caesarea, and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Okay, so he comes across here from Ephesus, over to Caesarea, and then he goes up to Antioch. All right, now why didn't he go straight to Jerusalem? I don't know. But he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went all over the country of Galatia and Phrygia, Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. So then he goes over here, back up in this era, area, Galatia and Phrygia. That's where this is. So he's going all over here. Did he go to Jerusalem? Well, if he did, Luke doesn't tell us. Maybe he went to a certain feast there because he had family there. He just wanted to go visit his family. I don't know. I've always wondered about that because it says he wants to go keep a feast in Jerusalem, but it doesn't tell us he went to Jerusalem. It said it says he, and then he went the other way. So maybe instead of going, he, he missed the feast. Maybe the boat trip took too long and he missed it or something. I don't know. But as we continue in the book of Acts, you know what we're going to find? Paul doing this again. And the Holy Spirit telling him, Paul, do not go to Jerusalem. And Paul says, I'm going anyway. And that's when Paul literally disobeys God. But yet God took that disobedience and turned it around for good because Paul went in chains to Rome and was able to win people in Rome to the Lord. So it's interesting how God can sometimes use a Christian's disobedience and turn it into good. Now, verse 23. We're almost done here with this chapter, but verse 23. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. 
Now verse 24, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent, eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. So up shows in Ephesus this fella named Apollos. Now Apollos came from Alexandria. Alexandria was a gigantic Jewish colony. Now, of course, it was founded by the Greeks, but many, many Jews moved to Alexandria. They had what was called the Jewish Quarter. Lots of Jews lived in Alexandria. And there were good schools in Alexandria, or well, I won't say good schools. There were schools in Alexandria, and they were taught philosophy. And Origen went there, and all these famous uh, Philo, and, and uh, all these famous so-called philosophers were from Alexandria. And so this guy goes to Alexandria. And he learns, and he was an eloquent, eloquent man. He was a learned man, mighty in the scriptures. He knew his Bible. But guess what? He was wrong. I find that so interesting that the Bible has nothing good to say about Alexandria. If you start looking about where the Bible comes from, our King James Bible comes from the Old Testament Jerusalem text, the Masoretic text, and the New Testament Greek textus receptus from the Antioch and Syria area. Byzantine text. That's where the true Word of God comes from. All new versions of the Bible come from the Alexandrian text, which are the Catholic Roman critical texts. And they are full of errors and mistakes. But our King James Bible is not. It comes from the right place because we're told that Jerusalem is where the Jews were, and Antioch of Syria is where the disciples of Christ were first called Christians. If you want to find the right line of Bible text, this is where you would go. You'd go right through here. If you wanted to find the perverted, the watered down, the mess with line of, of text of the Bible, this is where you go. Alexandria to Rome. So you have the pure line of Bible text, the right Bible text, where our King James Bible comes from. And then you have all other versions of the Bible. And they come from Alexandrian text that have been messed with by origin. So that's what you got there. And that's why every time the Bible talks about Alexandria, it's never in a good light. So why would you want a Bible from a place that the Bible says isn't good? So that's why I'm King James only, amen? And I've looked at where the King James comes from. It comes from the right text. I look at all new versions of the Bible. They come from the Westcott and Hort text, the Vaticanus, Rome, the Vatican, and the Sinaiticus, Sinaiticus, Sinai, Egyptian text. And they have errors, they have mistakes, they have whole verses missing, they have words missing, they have whole passages missing. I do not accept these false versions of the Bible. Only the King James. But anyway, he's from Alexandria. So he comes from the Alexandrian school of thought. And he was wrong. Look at verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. All he knew was the ministry of John, which was, hey, get baptized. So this guy, all he was doing was walking around and saying, repent and be baptized in water. So, he was preaching water baptism and repentance because your Messiah is coming. That's what the water baptism and repentance was for when John preached. John tells us in John 1 that the reason he came baptizing in water is to make the Christ manifest to Israel. So, he's going around trying to find Jews and telling them the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Now, verse 26, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him into them, and expounded to him the way of, the, of God more perfectly. Now Aquila and Priscilla were with Paul. So what would they have learned from Paul? Paul's message of you're justified by faith in the blood. So Aquila and Priscilla came back up here to Ephesus. And that's where they are right now in Ephesus. And they said, look, you're preaching the message of who, Jesus, of, of who, but you don't even know who he is yet. You're going around telling everybody the Messiah is coming, the God of is coming, get ready. Well, guess what? Jesus is the Messiah. And I'm sure he looked at that and goes, wow, okay. And so they preached who Jesus was, and then they showed him Paul's message of what Jesus did for him. So they expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now verse 27, And when he was disposed to pass into Icaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. So he learned the right way, but look at what he's teaching to Jews. Verse 28, For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures, that Jesus was Christ. So he was a very learned man, Apollos was. But he was from Alexandria. 
and he didn't have the right message. And tell these guys, did I write up here Aquila and Priscilla? Yeah. And tell these guys, said, look, you're doing good preaching all that you know, and that's all that you know, but since that happened, there's been a lot more stuff taking place. Why don't you let us tell you about the Bible, and about Paul, and about what the Bible says. Let us tell you who Jesus is, and then what he did for you. And Apollos then went and began to preach more to Jews, and his message was all about how Jesus was the Christ. Now, I assume he would also tell them the rest of the message, what Jesus did for them. But, uh, you know, I don't know. It doesn't say that. He should have preached also that Jesus died in his suffering of Christ, too. So that's Acts chapter 18. Um, chapter 19, we'll begin there in chapter 19. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain... And on and on and on. Chapter 19 is an interesting thing. In chapter 19, we find some people that are Jews that, uh, that God deals with a little bit differently here. And it's kind of confusing. That's why the book of Acts is a confusing book. It's a transitional book. You have to be very careful basing your doctrine in the book of Acts. You have to understand your doctrine. So next time we'll look at chapter 19, and I'll try my best to explain it correctly to you. But I want you to remember something in Acts chapter 19. These people in Acts chapter 19 are Jews. And uh, there's a thing that happens to them because they are Jews. And there's a certain way that they're dealt with here because they're Jews. And that's all I'll say about that. So thank you for watching. That was Acts chapter 18. I'm glad we're able to continue to use our map that we had up here in order to show you this. And we'll look at Acts chapter 19 next time. Hope this is a blessing to you. Hope this makes the book of Acts alive to you as you read it. And think about what you're reading. God bless. We'll see you next time.